Today's episode is brought to you by Tonic. Tonic is the digital agency that's good for business. Go ahead and get a hold of them today on their website at hellotonic.com. What do video game consoles and dependency injection have in common? Let's find out next. In the beginning, there were handheld games, and they were hard-coded. Then came the video game console, which allowed us to switch the games. This was an example of a real-world dependency injection. Did you notice? Here we can see the dependencies. Your class represented by the console. And of course, the DI framework. So if we take that real world example and apply it to our code here, I have a class called handheld single game console and it implements the iGame console. Right now, kind of never mind about the iGame console. What you should be focused on is we have one method, it's called load game, and inside that method we have a hard coded dependency and that game is Caterpillar. And what I mean by hard coded dependency, notice that we're using the keyword inside load game. And for me, I call that trapping a dependency. And what does that mean even further? Well, that means there's no way for me to swap out Caterpillar with a different game. Using dependency injection requires a certain mentality or mindset, and we have to conform to a few rules in order for this to make sense. The very first rule is only accept your dependencies through the constructor. We can also use property injection, but in general, we're gonna use just constructor injection. Secondly, we're going to avoid using the new keyword. The new keyword will trap our dependency inside of our methods or our classes, and we're going to avoid using the new keyword when at all possible. A few exceptions to that rule is when I new up a POCO model or if I'm creating a factory method or class. So stop right there. That's the part where my friend Pete Duncanson would say, is that really necessary? Do you really need to swap things out? And to Pete, I say to you, yes, it's absolutely worth swapping out things because when it comes to unit testing you'll almost swap everything and the way we're going to handle dependency injection is we're simply just going to ask for what we want and it'll be magically filled so today we'll be covering two ways to get your dependencies injected through the constructor into your class the first one is called poor man's dependency injection the second one will be using an ioc container poor man's dependency injection is essentially a manual way of doing your dependency uh, filling for your constructors whereas the IOC container is going to be an automatic hey I need this can you just give it to me so back into the code we go so as we see here this handheld single game console um, is what we're using and it's going to call load game so if we look at the single handheld game here its game is trapped by uh, this new keyword being used in low game. So what we're gonna do is we're going to have a new console. We're gonna call it a Super NES. It uses the iGame console and it has the low game. So rather than new up a game down here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a constructor up here and we're going to say, I want an iGame and we'll call it my game. We'll use some resharper goodness here to do a pattern that you should be very familiar with in dependency injection. Essentially what you'll do is you'll have a private read-only um, of your dependency and you'll initialize that down here. So resharper, as you saw, lets me do it automatically or you can manually type that. I would prefer um, to have something automatic like that. Now when I'm in my load game down here, I just do game dot play game. And this class here, the Super NES, doesn't know what game, doesn't ship from, from Nintendo, so to speak, knowing what game it will play. It just knows it will be an iGame. Now, if we pop back out here to our class here, it's going to look very similar. Uh, we're going to do new uh, Super NES, and now it's saying, hey, I need an iGame. It's at that point, or this point, I can say, well, let's do Super Mario World or Zelda. So if we do Caterpillar, uh, this should all just build and whatnot. So... This is a very simple illustration of the poor man's dependency injection. Now you may be asking yourself, well wait a second, you're trapping these new keywords here inside your main method here in this particular uh, program here. And to that I would say, um, at some point you have to actually commit to using your new keywords somewhere. 
the thing with dependency injection is you do that in one spot. It's basically where you register everything. And there's a term for that as well. It's called your composition root. So in your composition root, you're allowed to use your new keyword here. So uh, in our particular case here with uh, a console app, we have the composition root here. If you're running a uh, MVC site or a web API, uh, there, are, there are places that are considered the composition root where you're allowed to use the new keyword. Now, this will get very tedious here if we were to have, say, a more complicated game. So Caterpillar is a pretty easy game, right? So if we were to have a game like uh, Zelda here, which is one of my favorites, um, let's say that this one here also needs some things. It needs some characters, maybe, and needs some weapons. So uh, we could do it one way, which would be, I would say, the wrong way, which would be new uh, weapon equals... Let's see, if we knew up a weapon here, um, maybe a sword. Yeah, there we go. Oops, let's try that again. All right, so we have a sword here. Now we can use the sword somewhere um, within this method, or let's say we're in the play game method, whatnot. The, the trouble here is, again, we're trapping that new keyword. So what we would really want to do is, through the constructor, we would say, hey, I need to use a sword, and it's an eye weapon. And we're going to use resharper again, if I can spell right, to auto initialize. Again, that's the pattern you should be using there. Now we can use this weapon here, and we can say attack. And usually, you probably won't do that in the start method here. So let's go ahead and put it in the play game method here and go. Now, link, or <laughs> we don't have link yet, but we. The game right now doesn't know which sword you're going to use. So if we now pop back out here to our Super NES and say, let's do a new Zelda game, it's going to now require a new weapon. So we're going to have to do new sword. As you can start to see here, this is going to get out of control super darn fast. So um, there is a different way to approach this, and this is using default constructors. So of course, everyone has their own opinions of dependency injection, what's good, what's bad, what's indifferent. But one thing that gets tedious real quick about the poor man's method there, as you can see, you have to nest all these new this, new this, new this, and it can get really out of control really fast. So the thing that I would posit to you is this something called default constructors with poor man's dependency injection. And what it is, is it's like the Super Nintendo actually shipped with the game already in it, but it still remains swappable. Okay, so the goal here is to pretty much drop uh, all these nested news into maybe something simpler. That something simpler means, let's go to the sword class here. and Actually, we're going to go to the Zelda class here. I'll take that back. And so when we depend on an eye weapon, what we can do is add a second constructor. And it's going to be a default constructor. Notice I'm not going to take any parameters here. However, the first thing I want to do here is do this. And I'm going to call my other... Um, constructor here, but I'm going to provide it with a default item. And yes, this is where the controversy will be, because we're actually using the new keyword here inside of a class. However, I would say that this is a pretty good trade-off between making it super abstract that somebody may not know what's going on and kind of, um, you know, indicating what you're actually using here. Now, as far as coupling goes, yes, we've now coupled ourselves to a new sword, but we can also uh, reason that a sword is so intrinsic to the system that you would never not want a sword and it's native to the system. So if we again pop out here to the Super Nintendo, we need to do the same thing here. We need to say, you know what? The Super Nintendo now ships with a, uh, a default game. So in the real world, this would be, you know, and you get the Super Nintendo, but it came with a game. All right, it came with Zelda. We're all happy. And again, we're making that same trade-off here because now we're saying the Super Nintendo is somehow linked no pun intended, to the Zelda game here. And then if we come out here, this still applies. So this will actually be very helpful, this syntax, when we want to do unit testing. But now we can also do things like this. We can say, you know what? I don't have to give you a sword. So uh, just use the default one. And now I can also say, you know, I don't have to give you a game. Just use the Super Nintendo. So now when we run this, and at runtime we say game console.load, and let's go ahead and try that. Go ahead and hit run. Hopefully, uh, we'll just be playing Zelda just out of the box here. Oops. And it flashed there on the screen briefly. 
So let's uh, let's add one thing here to pause our app. Read key and try again. Bingo! Swing this giant sword, killing Ganon. If we want to look deeper in to make sure that we are using those default dependencies, we can look at the sword, swinging this giant sword, and we can look into uh, the Zelda game here, where it says we're loading Zelda and we're killing Ganon. All right. So in general, we lightly touched on what poor man's dependency injection, and there's nothing magical whatsoever about poor man's. It's essentially writing your classes in a solid way. Don't trap your new keyword because that's creating a dependency where you can't swap it out. And then we realize and we acknowledge that poor man's can get real tedious if you have to do the new nested new dependencies all the way down. It's just it's just something you can't manage. So one uh, off ramp that you can do there between uh, using the next topic, which will be the using the IOC container and poor man's, is to use those default constructors. Now keep in mind, a lot of people will say if they're purists with a dependency injection they'll say ah but you're creating a coupling but to me on very simple projects or even medium projects it's a completely valid trade-off to say look um, let's make this very solid we'll be able to inject anything we need in here for dependency injection or to alter our behavior slightly however let's just have defaults for a lot of these things because at runtime unless we're testing we're not actually going to switch out anything and now we get to the part that usually scares everybody when it comes to dependency injection, mainly because they don't know on how it works. And what I'm talking about is the IOC container. So we've been learning about dependency injection. So far we've been doing it the poor man's way or kind of manually uh, filling the dependencies through the constructor. So now what we're going to do now is look at, at a way that's going to automate the process through the use of a, uh, a C-sharp object which holds on to your uh, dependencies for you and that way when it's time to create anything that the container knows about it'll know how to get those dependencies okay let's illustrate some of the ideas we're talking about we have our dependencies i game i weapon i game console we need to put those into a container and our framework will provide that to us our di framework then decides okay if we need to build something let's say an i game console let's grab that and let's look at see what it depends on in this case an eye game and then that depends on an eye weapon and what it does is it goes to the container and gets an instance to each one of these and there we go all right so to recap what we're going to do is we're going to download uh, what we call an IOC container and there's a bunch of them out there there's Autofact, there's an inject there's Castle Windsor unity there's a bunch of them out there in fact it's probably tradition that eventually when you get into this deep enough you build your own but you realize that you probably just want to use one of those um, so once you get that installed what we'll do is we'll register all of our dependencies with the container and then when we need something we'll resolve which is a fancy word in the IOC container world where we basically say hey go figure out all the things this depends on from top to bottom and then give me an instance back and from there we can actually use our instance okay we find ourselves back in code again so our objective this time is to use a dependency injection container rather than use poor man's uh, dependency injection so one of the first things I want to do is I want to kind of undo uh, some of the poor man things and to do that we'll get rid of the default constructor and we'll be much more loosely coupled because now this has nothing to do with a particular concrete instance of anything and if we go to the, let's see, the Super NES, and we'll also get rid of it there too. So we have no default constructors at this point. If we go out here, it's now complaining that, oh no, you now have to do the long form, which would have been this here as a reminder. Uh, let's run that just to make sure it works again. There we go. But now the goal is, is to not have to do this, as you see here, where you have the new, new, new. Let's say these are very complicated. So the first thing you want to do is select a DI container. And for this example, we're going to use Microsoft's Unity. And I've already pre-installed it by uh, using the install package Unity, and it installs. The next thing I want to do is create a container. Remember, the container is going to hold all of the known dependencies in the entire application. So what I'll do is I'll do var container equals new unity container. And they, these are, are different based on the frameworks. So now that we have our container, we're going to register each of our dependencies. So container dot uh, register type. We're going to say anytime you need an iGameConsole, 
I want you to use a uh, Super Nintendo. I want you to create one of those. Notice I'm just passing types. There's no parameters, nothing like that. So that's where some of the magic is. Next, uh, I need to register an iGame. So what game should we use with this uh, system here? Well, we're going to use uh, Zelda. And then we know Zelda depends on a eye weapon. So whenever Zelda says, hey, I need an eye weapon, what should I use? Uh, we're going to go ahead and say, well, you're going to use a sword. And that will simplify greatly this down here. In fact, to the point where I don't need any of this. So now I say, hey, container. I need a Super Nintendo, but I don't say Super Nintendo because we need to talk in abstractions at this point. I need to say I need an iGame console. And to do that, we're going to resolve it. So we're going to do a resolve, and we're going to say, go give me an iGame console. And what you'll get back depends completely on whatever you've registered here. Now, oftentimes, you'll move this code right here into its own registration class, and there's at least three ways to be able to register your items. I, this is the explicit way where it's configuration and code. It says when you want one of those, uh, provide one of those. When you want one of those, provide one of those, and so on and so forth. The second way is to use reflection and uh, do it by convention. So we won't cover that here. Your DI framework of choice documentation will cover that. And then uh, lastly, you can register it through the app or the web config as a late binding option. However, a lot of people don't like that due to the possibility of typos and whatnot, but that's totally an option for you. Okay, now that uh, we have a game console and it resolved here, uh, we should know that we should get a Super Nintendo because that's what we registered. If we want it to be uh, a Nintendo 64 or, or whatever, as long as it inter implements the iGame console, the container doesn't care and it'll just resolve it plus all of its dependencies. So let's go ahead and run this and see what's going on. Hey, it looks like uh, we're back to where we want to be and it's resolving that. So let's look into what could possibly go wrong. Well, let's say I forgot to register a dependency here. So we'll just comment out the sword. This should throw an exception. And what it's going to tell us here is, long story short, I was trying to fill the uh, iWeapon interface, uh, but it wasn't there, so I'm going to blow up. So this is one of the major drawbacks, in my opinion, of a DI container. If you don't register something, um, it will compile, it will build, but it won't die until runtime. So if we restore that there and run this, actually we'll have to continue and then rerun it. Never mind that. That will resolve. So next thing we can do is we can say, hey, let's, uh, let's do Super Mario World instead. So let's run that. And what do we get here? Jumping on Bowser's head. How does that work? Well, simple. Uh, Super Mario World is over here in the iGame world. And here we go. It's an iGame and it just resolves. Look at that. It does not have any dependencies on anything. So if we want to say, you know what? Mario now knows how to use a sword. And we can do that by saying, hey, Mr. Mario World, uh, you need an iWeapon. Your game is uh, totally different. In fact, Let's not use a sword, let's use a hammer. But we don't say a hammer right here because that wouldn't be very solid and it would, it, it would be uh, tightly coupled to that. So what we're going to do is we're just going to do the weapon again and we're going to use reflection to give our boilerplate code there. And then while we're playing the game, we'll say attack. And notice here we didn't say hammer or sword, so what will he get? Because we have a hammer over here. And we have a sword here. So it all depends on what we registered. So if we come back out here to the registration, right now we should expect that he's using a sword. So if we run this here, swinging his giant, this giant sword jumping on Bowser's head. Okay, awesome. So we've just somehow magically changed Super Mario World, how it works, because he uses a sword instead of a hammer. But if we kind of want to return to back where you can use a hammer in Mario World, uh, I weapon uh, or hammer implements I weapon, so this should work no problem. And now we've swapped that out successfully. That now we're smashing things with a hammer and jumping on Bowser's head. So there's uh, a pattern here to follow. You should register, resolve, and then release. I'm not sure if Unity has a release uh, option here, but basically it's deregister um, the the particular uh, thing that you resolved. 
Castle Windsor, you can uh, resolve and then uh, dispose of it. Uh, some take care of it automatically for you. Unity might be one of those. Another thing is, is you should ask the question, how many Super Nintendos or Super Mario Worlds or hammers do I use in the entire uh, running of the whole programs? To illustrate, let's have Game Console 1 and Game Console 2. And when I run this, um, we'll have Game Console 1 and we'll have Game Console 2. So just that quickly, I should have two separate game consoles and you can see I am doing that there. The question I'm really asking is, is how many hammers were created, how many Super Mario Worlds were created, and how many Super Nintendos were created? Was just one created of each one of these or did it reuse over and over? So that concept is known as your, your life cycle or your lifestyle. So depending on your framework of choice, it might be singleton by default, which means it'll just reuse if you don't tell me otherwise, or it'll be transient, meaning as soon as you're done using this and you need another one, I'm going to new up a new one for you. So you can influence that typically in your uh, DI framework by doing something like this. Uh, so. Now we've explicitly said, hey, Mr. Super Nintendo, uh, every time somebody wants one of you, we're going to new a, a new one up. And it's not because of this new keyword here. It's because of the transient. So if we want to uh, just reuse the uh, Super Mario World over and over and over, um, there's uh, singleton and, and different lifestyles depending on your framework uh, of choice. So it's very important that you understand the, the life cycle of your dependencies because it really could cause you troubles with threading and things like that. So, that being said, um, there's a lot of perils which we'll cover next. So let's talk about some of the perils that come along with an IOC container. In fact, there's enough where I'm actually gonna have to read to you because I had to write them down there so many, I didn't wanna miss anything. So you need to make sure you register all your dependencies before you call resolve for the first time. So meaning I can't ask somebody to create me an object or the container or the framework to say, give me an object if I haven't registered all of my dependencies. Makes sense. Next, uh, you need to make sure you release all of your constructed um, items that the framework has given you, otherwise you might run into memory issues. Next, uh, be careful about your life cycles or your, your lifestyles, depending on framework calls it different things, because if, if you need singleton or transient or there's about three other one per threads, a popular one, you can really tie yourselves in a knot. Um, you can have state problems, threading, you know, all kinds of things. So make sure you, you uh, pay attention to what's going on there. Um, only use the resolve method in your composition route. Other, um, otherwise, uh, you're kind of using it as a service locator, and that's not what a DI container is supposed to do. Uh, in the case of, say, an MVC or a web API, um, usually you have a controller factory, and that's where you're going to go ahead and, and uh, register your container with uh, the MVC framework or the web API framework, and it's going to know how to interact with your container. Uh, next, uh, your will, your DI framework of choice will have a ton of options. Make sure you RTFM, and uh, there's a ton of options that we didn't cover here, so make sure you read the manual. Uh, and then finally, the big thing that gets me more times than not is uh, the compiler can't help you during a build when everything is so dynamic because DI containers use so much reflection um, to figure out what's in the, the app domain that um, at compile time, everything's gonna look okay. And a lot of things tend to become missing because we forgot to register them or we registered them improperly. We had a typo if we used XML, we used the wrong bit of reflection, etc. So a lot of times when you use a DI container, things will fail at runtime a lot that would have normally been caught by a static compiler. Maybe Pete's right. Maybe this is uh, not worth the effort. So here's what my advice is to everybody. So I think programming to solid principles are really, really important and it gives you flexibility and allows for swappability unit testing. Me personally, I like poor man's dependency injection on any project I start. I don't want to immediately grab an IOC container because as you see, there's a lot of trade-offs that you might have to make for all this cool functionality. There's a lot of things that could go wrong. And on a development team, especially one that may be not prepared to use dependency injection frameworks uh, like an IOC container, it can really challenge them and really give you possibly more trouble than it actually solves. 
I just really want to quickly uh, kind of call out one of my favorite books. It's uh, .NET Dependency Injection by Mark Seaman. It's a really awesome book. It takes away a lot of the mystery around the IOC container side of things and even why do we do dependency injection in general. So if you haven't read it before, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. I'll put a link probably somewhere under the video for you to be able to get to it. Hey guys, thanks again for watching. Uh, make sure you subscribe so we can keep doing this. Thanks. Bye.